So I am Helen Marshall, and I am the general director of the Center for Science Fiction and Fantasy at Anglia Ruskin University. And the center is really a research network uh, whose goal is to study the formation of science fiction and fantasy within publishing in the entertainment industries, as well as to champion it to a wider audience. We're also launching a low residency MA that's going to start in the next school year. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I do have a bunch of flyers, so do come and see me about that. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about primarily and that the center is interested in is how we might use science fiction as a tool for understanding our lives, particularly in this sort of strange period of the 21st century that we find ourselves in. And to do that, I wanted to begin with a quote from T.S. Eliot, who said, For last year's words belong to last year's language, and next year's words await another voice. To make an end is to make a beginning. So the evening's theme is interrogating the future, which does seem particularly appropriate uh, for a time in which the future seems to be a giant, scary question mark. And I come at this talk from a strange perspective. Uh, I suppose I was one of those people, and likely not the only person in this room, who woke up on November 9th in what seemed to be an alternate reality. And I remember logging on that morning and experiencing almost a doubling of vision as if the universe had split into two radically different tracks that were diverging from one another. And there was a hallucinatory space of, of about a week or so in which I still felt as if I could see an alternate reality kind of layered underneath the world around me. So I felt shock and disorientation and not a little bit of fear, uh, but also bewilderment at the fragility of the norms and traditions that I had come to understand to be bedrocks of reality, which turned out to be bedrocks of my reality. And so my point in this isn't to rehash politics and event frustration, but to look at this experience critically as a way of thinking about what literature, particularly the literature of ideas, the literature of science fiction is and what it ought to do. A, a week ago, a friend of mine pointed me in the direction of Juno Diaz's excellent article on the earthquake in Haiti, which was published in the Boston Review. And he writes there of the etymology of the word apocalypse. He argues there are those, he argues that there are three kinds of apocalypses. There are those that follow the actual imagined end of the world. There are those that comprise catastrophes which resemble the imagined end. And there are those disruptive events that provoke revelation. The apocalypse, he says, quoting James Berger, is the end, or it resembles the end, or it explains the end. So we are, by all accounts, no matter where you might fit yourself in the political spectrum, in an apocalyptic moment. We are witnessing the end of something, or an event that resembles it, and we're searching for an account that might explain that end. So on November 9th, I had the privilege of teaching a group of MA short story writers at Anglia Ruskin University. And it was an evening class. And the students had always been a really lively group. Uh, they, were full of, they were full of questions and comments and jokes and affection for one another. And I didn't know how to address them. Uh, one of my colleagues had told me not to talk about Trump or to just leave it out of the room, uh, but it seemed impossible to not be able to acknowledge that something had happened. It struck me as interesting that despite all of the anger and anguish that I had seen on Facebook and Twitter, uh, because I have many, many American friends, uh, as if to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi, a million voices were all crying out at once, people were turning to literature for answers. Uh, so they were discussing 1984 and Brave New World. They were quoting from Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale. And they were welcoming each, welcoming each other to the Hunger Games. So I told my students the only thing I could reasonably think of to say, which was a phrase ben, that I got from Ben Markowitz from Royal Holloway. And that is that the purpose of creative writing is, on the one hand, to help students get published in the best cases. But in all cases, Regardless of the quality of the writing, it was to help students to become better witnesses to the world. And that is what we all are. We are all witnesses to the world. And the tools of storytelling can help us in this respect. They can help us to understand the world, to observe it, to process it, 
And this is a fundamentally imaginative act. And it's an act that has great power, the power to witness. We are living in an apocalyptic moment and we have the duty to be witnesses. We have the duty to observe, to imagine, to speculate and to create. Science fiction is a genre that knows about apocalypses. I have a new PhD student, Chandra Clark, and her proposal argues that although much recent science fiction has been dystopian, we need alternative visions of the future to help us find better ways forward. And it's easy to forget that we're also witnessing the beginning of something, a moment whose direction hasn't fully been determined yet. And the reader of science fiction is, I think, in the best possible position to take advantage of this. That reader's mind has been shaped by the exploration of imaginative worlds, by possible futures, by alternative pasts. The science fiction reader is adept at finding himself or herself in a strange new land. And yet when I find myself speaking to writers of science fiction, the one thing I've heard most frequently is how very different the landscape of writing feels at the moment. Our readers don't have the same shared assumptions about reality that we might have counted on a year ago. And it seems impossible to write without acknowledging that change. So Gary Dunyon on Twitter cleverly uh, captured the zeitgeist by pulling together a number of headlines screen grabbed from the Guardian's feed of the most viewed articles that day. So they included these. Suspect in North Korea killing thought she was taking part in TV prank. Robert Mugabe could contest election as corpse, wife says. German parents told to destroy doll that can spy on children. So his caption, season four of Black Mirror is coming along nicely. Indeed. So the Twitter account for Black Mirror says, our job is to explain what's happening to you as best we can. And we've seen in the last 18 months, it's becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish between fact and fiction. And I can only imagine that problem is going to get worse. And so I go back to T.S. Eliot. For last year's words belong to last year's language and next year's words await another voice. To make an end is to make a beginning. And this reminds me of an article written by the brilliant but provocative Jonathan McCalmont about the state of weird fiction. So weird fiction is a strange beast. It's an eclectic genre or subgenre uh, that originated in the late 19th century within the works of authors such as Edgar Allan Poe, Arthur Mackin, and M.R. James, amongst others. And over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries, it's expanded to encompass new writers like China Mieville. Weird fiction is notable for its generic uncertainty. It's a blend of science fiction and horror, maybe, or of literary fiction and horror, maybe, or of Lovecraft and whatever happens to be floating close at hand at any given particular moment. Uh, so Michael Kelly of Undertow Press invited me to be the series editor for the fourth volume of the year's best weird fiction, which reprints material published from the previous year. And so I've spent the last four months grappling with what weird fiction is. Lovecraft stated that his desire in writing weird fiction was to achieve momentarily the illusion of some strange suspension or violation of the galling limitations of space, time, and natural law, which has a particularly Lovecraftian feel to it, I think. Uh, so he said, these stories frequently emphasize the element of horror because fear is our deepest and strongest emotion and the one which best lends itself to the creation of nature-defying illusions. Horror and the unknown or the strange are always closely connected so that it's hard to create a convincing picture of shattered natural law without laying stress on the emotion of fear. The reason why time plays a great part in so many of my tales is that this element looms up in my mind as the most profoundly dramatic and grimly terrible thing in the future. Conflict with time seems to me to be the most potent and fruitful theme in all human expression. And in this respect, weird fiction seems to me like a perfect vehicle for exploring our present moment. For it does seem, I think, to many of us anyway, that time is out of joint. Are we moving back to the happy utopia of the 1950s? Are we moving towards a dystopia in the future? Are we returning or progressing? We don't know, we can't decide, and the possibilities are not so much divergent, I think, is layered on top of one another. We're existing in multiple moments at once, 
in multiple times at once, and it can be scary. Anne and Jeff Vandermeer, in their introduction to the Weird Compendium, recognize the murky taxonomy of weird fiction writing. Because the weird often exists in the interstices, because it can occupy different territories simultaneously, an impulse exists amongst the more rigid taxonomists to find the weird suspect, to argue it should not and cannot be separated from other traditions. So weird fiction then is used to this strange overlapping, the occupation of simultaneous moments at once. But when I asked one of my students to give me a personal definition of weird fiction, there was one, Marion Womack, uh, who had the most interesting answer. And she said, we have a long tradition of this in Spain, and this only increased during the dictatorship as a new symbolic way of communicating ideas was rehearsed in narratives. So this kind of fantasy in which something isn't quite right lends itself very well to Gothic sensibility with its convoluted use of language. And then there's the element of irrationality built into the rational. Coming from a Spanish background, I interpret this as surrealism, uh, which is for me a major element I recognize in weird writing. So this definition struck me as really capturing the essence of the weird tale, the embedding of irrationality within the rational a way of writing which uses the one to expose the other and to make the reader realize that all rational systems are ultimately partially irrational. It's a rev revelatory mode of writing, an apocalyptic mode of writing. But Jonathan McCalmont, I was passed his article by Nina Allen, a science fiction writer, uh, and McCalmont traces the history of the resurgence of weird fiction in the 20th century. In particular, he focuses on several months in 2003 when the TTA press message boards were alive with this huge discussion going on about what the nature of the new weird was. And the discussion was prompted in part uh, by the success of China Mieville, who had published The Scar and received critical acclaim in the British Fantasy Awards. Uh, the topic of discussion was the rise of this sort of weird new type of writing which seemed to have links to the past but the forum was riven with disputes about the act of naming this kind of writing. And M. John Harrison summed up the problem. He said, if I don't throw my hat in the ring and write a preface or do a guest editorial here uh, or write a review in The Guardian there, then I'm leaving it to Michael Moorcock and editors to describe what I and the British authors I admire are writing. So there was during this period a distinct suspicion of the rise of both the conventional and commercial frameworks which tended to define new waves of writing and which would go on to attempt to define the nature of the so-called new weird. But in looking at these discussions, Jonathan McCalmont said something that really struck me. He said, every cultural entity, be it a genre, a subgenre, a scene, a movement, or a school, is born of a particular time and place, a sudden awareness that the wider culture has changed and that the old tools are no longer up to the job. So I believe we are in one of those moments and that the old tools of writing no longer seem to be up to the job. As T.S. Eliot said, last year's words belong to last year's language and next year's words await another voice. So the language I found for myself is the language of weird fiction, which in my mind speaks to the irrationality of our present foundering systems. We are living in weird times, times that seek to recall a distant glorified past while we simultaneously rocket towards an uncertain future. But we need new tools to interrogate the future. We need a new language to understand it, to articulate our concerns, our hopes, our dreams, and our possibilities. The faculty at Anglia Ruskin University put together the Center for Science Fiction and Fantasy to articulate the value of these genres, uh, which haven't always enjoyed the critical and popular appeal they have today. So many of you, I'm sure, would agree that science fiction has long provided a way of looking towards the future. It isn't necessarily intended to predict the future, although sometimes it does this. The point is to contemplate the future, to renew our hope and our willingness to act and to act wisely. It questions what it means to be human. And so I want to end with a short capsule of a story uh, that comes from Day of Wrath, which was published by Sivor Gensovsky in 1964 and translated recently by James Womack for the big book of science fiction. So Gensovsky was writing at the height of the Cold War and he was a keen observer of the absurdities and ruthlessness of human nature. 
In this story, a biological experiment results in human-like creatures called otarks with superior intellectual abilities that terrorize the Russian countryside. And a journalist travels to observe the otarks and quickly finds himself at their mercy. In his final account, he begins an article for his newspaper titled, What is a Man? The story says, his optimism, which he had been so proud of, was in the final analysis the optimism of an ostrich. He had just buried his head when it came to the bad news. He read about executions in Paraguay in the newspapers, or about famine in India, but spent his time thinking about how to get money to buy new furniture for his large five-room apartment, or how he might be able to win the good opinion of some important person or other. The Otarks shot crowds of protesters, speculated on the price of bread, prepared wars in secret, and he turned away from it all, pretending that nothing of the kind had ever happened. And from this point of view, all of his past life suddenly seemed strongly connected with what was happening to him now. As the journalist approaches his death, he contemplates the final words of his dead companion. Maybe it's a good thing that the Otarks have appeared. Now it will become clear what it means to be a human. Now we will all know that to be a human, is, it is not enough to be able to count and to study geometry. There's something else. And the story ends with a chilling conclusion. Humanity has defined itself on the basis of its intelligence and thus established its dominion over other animals. But if a new race were created, a race of even greater intelligence, how then would humanity define itself? If we were forced to do so, what qualities would we align ourselves with? So the Otarks are, of course, a metaphor, but they're not only a metaphor. They're a way of posing a question that we face today, just as we faced it in the 1960s. How will science and technology force us to rethink who we are and how we relate to the wider world? Science fiction is the language of imagining, the language of interrogating, of asking uncomfortable questions, of challenging ideologies, of exploring the future, anticipating it, changing it, we are all witnessing the world right now, and it is up to us to find our new language, knowing that to make an end is also to make a beginning. Thanks very much. <laughs>